What's up everybody, how's it going? And welcome back to another episode of Car Ant. Today, we are excited not only to be back, but also to start a new mini-series that we're titling Unexpected. To clarify, this series is all about cars and vehicles that you would not expect to be project cars or good platforms for modifying and building. It's a doozy, there's tons of stuff in this little series, and it's not just cars, but trucks, micro cars and even wagons. I hope you guys are ready for this because there are some really cool and unique vehicles on this list that I feel like just get overlooked by the majority of anyone in any given circle in car culture. See, when we think of a project car or a modified car, often our attention goes to things like RX-7s, Supras, Chargers, Miatas, other forms of German touring cars, mainly Beamers and Mercs, there's a list. And most of the time people stick to just that list. But me being the curious sort of fellow that I am, I wanted to check out the world and see what else was out there that people could build. After all, there are hundreds of cars, millions on the road, and a million more sitting in yards waiting to be sold. How many of those could be turned into something cool, unique, fun, exciting, fast, or just a show car. Today, we're gonna to tackle five of those on this episode of Unexpected. To start off this list, we had the Acura TL, specifically the third and fourth generation. Now, if you're not familiar with this car at all or not a Honda fanboy whatsoever, then this is gonna be a car that you are completely unaware of. But if you know your stuff and if you know your stats, this is a car that you should really pay attention to. After all, it's a newer vehicle from 2004 till 2014 that actually had a six-speed manual. Not only did this car have an amazing exterior, very comfortable interior, and just all in all the good Honda quality, given that it's an Acura, it actually outsold the MDX. So chances are, there's probably a TL for sale somewhere in someone's lot, just waiting to be picked up. While these cars are heavily slept on, they have J-Series engines, which if you're not familiar with, they were used in a wide variety of different Acura models, but also were inside of things like Honda Odysseys. So naturally, these cars had a lot of power for what they were. They were heavily overlooked by, say, the K-Series brethren of the Civics and Accords and whatnot, but they still make for a very comparable chassis and one that honestly has a classier exterior than, say, the Civics of their generation. Chances are you can probably pick up one of these models for relatively cheap, somewhere around the three to 5,000 range in decent condition, given that its initial price tag would have definitely priced out your potential Civic owner. So it's probably had a better life as a result, maybe not been trailer trash. Because of this, this is a car and a model that honestly needs more attention. I mean, a J-Series motor can be built to ridiculously high numbers. Check out BZ Moto for more on that. And you can get it in a manual, manual front-wheel drive sedan. I would say that's a good time. Keeping in line with the Hondas, we have the Honda CRV out of the 90s. Now this is a vehicle that I have a very special place in my heart for because I have seen some really, really nicely done up versions of these and people sleep on them all the time. In the 90s and still sold here in America, the CRV was a very popular model that a lot of people bought for their families. It was the beginnings of the SUV era. And to be honest, this was pretty much an SUV, even though it was just really a big boxy Civic on steroids. Literally half the parts in the engine bay and transmission can bolt into a CRV with a little bit of help. In fact, many people now take the engines out of CRVs and put them in Civics because the B20 is just an impressively big motor that you can basically make a Frankenstein version of a K-Series out of. 2 liter VTEC heads off of, say, a Type R block. What's not to like? It already comes in these cars. And guess what? Just like the TL, it has a manual option. You could have got these at a 5 speed, and given that many different B-series transmissions could have made it to this, 
Swapping one in isn't that hard. The mod support for things like the Civic and the Integra also ties into the CRV, and as a result, there are tons of aftermarket support options, both to dump the car on bags or static on coils, and also lift it with the potential of lifter blocks and things like that. There's so much potential wrapped up in these cars, and you can boost these things to the moon because it's a B20, it's a really strong block, it's two liter, and as we all know, anything with the letters B or K in the Honda world, it's gonna have some form of charging, whether it's turbo, supercharger, or pro charger. These cars are actually becoming more difficult to find, but if you can find one and can tolerate the condition that the family who originally bought it in the 1990s left it in, you're probably looking around three grand for a nicer one, and you're probably having to spend a little bit more to get the manual because it wasn't that common to be bought. It's not a sports car, but there were some people in that era that wanted that manual despite the automatics becoming a rising threat to the manuals. Next on my list is a car that I absolutely love and I don't see enough of them on the roads anymore and that is the 03 Mitsubishi OZ Rally Edition. For anyone who's been a part of this channel for the last several years you know that we've had an OZ Rally. We've built up parts on an OZ Rally and they are incredibly fun cars that we've done so many stupid things to and with. While these can be obtained for under $5,000 and honestly in some places under $3,000, they didn't have the greatest engine. They didn't have the greatest anything, honestly, and they need a lot of help to really get a lot of sauce out of them. But what you do get out of these cars is a lot of reliability, an extremely fun chassis, and one that is so lightweight that it honestly can compare to a Civic of the same era and the era previously. They're good cars for just daily driving and building a really nice daily out of, but also just throwing them around. I actually knew a guy who did front wheel drive time attack where like the low power category in one of these cars that he then boosted and did a lot of other things to, but they handle amazingly. In fact, Ian has had some issues getting used to the car because even though it's front wheel drive, it still pulls like it's all wheel drive or rear wheel drive. That's just because of how tight you can make that chassis with the aftermarket parts that are available to it. There's so much you can do, and there have been some really clean examples of them that haven't been too riced out thanks to the fact that it does share parts with the Evo. Yes, the entire interior is identical to the Evo except for three main components. The seats, the white gauges, and the steering wheel. The next car on my list is actually a car that I have a deep personal connection to, and that's because my late grandfather had one, and that is the Mercury Grand Marquis. While most people oftentimes will go straight for the lovely Ford Interceptor known as the Crown Victoria, the Grand Marquis was the nicer trim option package deal, if you will, that was available from good old Fomico. Specifically, the one that I'm putting on this list is the first gen because it has beautiful classic boxy styling. It was an incredibly easy ride, beautiful interior, very comfortable for long distance driving, and it came with one of the most legendary engines ever known to man, and that is a Windsor V8, which is, in case you weren't aware, the heart of the Hoonicorn. Yeah, this is a motor with a lot of potential if you're willing to put in the money and the time and the effort. While it's heavier and very cushy as a result of all the luxury styling that it supposedly has. These were incredibly good cars. They were tanks. These are gonna be cars that last and last a long time, especially if you take care of them. And if you are cunning with the Ford V8, you can get a lot of sauce out of them if you know what you're doing. After all, Ford aftermarket parts are kind of America's deal. And given that these were cars that oftentimes were seen driven by elderly, such as in my case. Uh, chances are you're going to find one that was well maintained and probably on the cheaper side for resale value because of its age. So if you're lucky and you know what you're looking for, go find yourself one of these. These are going to be that diamond in the rough that honestly you could make into a really clean show build or maybe even some kind of SoCal lowrider style with hydraulics and everything else. After all, a lot of the parts that would have gone under this 
can also be found under a Crown Vic. And to round off our list of unexpected good project cars, we have the Subaru SVX. Easily one of the most 90s cars to ever exist on this list. Period. For those who don't know, the Subaru SVX was their attempt at getting into the luxury game market in the early 90s. This was built from 1991 to 1996. Its styling was so different from everything else they had going on at the time that it almost didn't even fit their lineup of cars ever. In fact, the styling looks very much like a Mark III Supra or a first-gen Eclipse. It just doesn't fit your idea of a legacy or a WRX early concept or even anything like that. It was so uniquely different that it actually ended up failing and the brand only made one generation of it before they finally pulled the plug on it. But that said, it is an extremely unique car. It came with an H6, which is basically a flat six. It's different for even their brand and very much more Porsche than it is Subaru. With the option for front wheel or all wheel drive, unfortunately strapped to a four speed auto, it's not the most luxurious thing ever, but also it's not the most peppy thing ever. Yet there are some very good examples of these being modified and turned into classy street cars. You know, think the whole VIP game, but with a Subaru. While not the most popular item ever, it still had a decent amount of sales, enough so that finding one is still possible, even if it's going to be a bit of a stretch to get and also get parts for if you need to maintain it or you want to build it up even further. But it's one of those weird cars that has that weird cool thing going on for it that it's enough of a unique oddity that it makes it cool, if that makes any sense. I mean, Fiat Panda? At any rate, these would make great VIP cars. Like I said, it does have some of that sort of Supra-esque styling to it, mixed with maybe a little Fiero even. So it's still worth giving it a shot and checking out. And finding one, well, given that they're kind of hard to get, uh, I'm not gonna put a price tag out there because I knew one guy that got one for a thousand bucks, and then I saw one up for sale for 9,000 bucks. So, good luck, happy hunting. So there you go, five unexpected good builds that you could make relatively cheap, but also aren't exactly cars you'd find at your local car meet, especially the Grand Marquis. There's like five people I know that would go for an old school Grand Marquis. Most people like the whole Marauder, which was the thing that kind of took its place later. It's just a special car. I, if I could find one, I would totally build one and swap in a manual and all that jazz because it would be so cool to have one of those again. But with all of that said, what are some unexpected cars that you want to see on this list? After all, this is a mini-series and we can keep it on going so long as you guys find me cool cars or I also just happen to stumble upon that one weird Facebook ad that actually birthed this whole concept. But with that said, thank you all for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Like and sub if you haven't already. Stay tuned, because more is on the way. With that said, God bless y'all.